The Where Our Minds Wanda podcast may contain sensitive content and explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Greetings, fellow wanderers, to the places our minds wander. The house at the end of the dirt road, where disembodied voices whisper and strange sounds make the living shiver. Where shadows lurk at the edge of the woods, just outside your back door. And mysterious lights speed beyond reason across the clear night sky. Odd events throughout time that lead you down the rabbit hole. I'm Wes. And I'm Beth. And this is where our minds wander. Hello and welcome to Where Our Minds Wander, all you fellow wanderers. I'm Wes, and sitting across from me is my wife and co-host, Beth. Hello, everyone. We'd like to thank all of you devoted listeners who join us every week and all of our new listeners who heard me on Jim Harold's campfire and decided to give us a try. Because whether you know it or not, it means everything to a small podcast like ours that doesn't have deep pockets to spend on advertising. We work really hard in our spare time to bring you the best content possible, so thank you so much for your support. Yes, thank you, everyone. And we have a couple of things to mention before we get into tonight's stories. If you haven't checked out our premium bonus episodes yet, please give one a try. Yeah, there's a bunch of them for you to choose from on all different topics, And they're just $3 an episode, and the money you spend goes directly back into our production costs each month. Yeah, and another way to support our show is by jumping on Spotify or Apple Podcast and giving us a five-star review and a comment. It's free to do, it only takes a few seconds, and it really helps us out because your reviews and comments move us up on the podcast list so more people can find us. And lastly, if you haven't joined our Where Our Minds Wander Facebook page yet, you should do that because we post pictures and updates and it's a great place to find like-minded people. Or you could follow us on Twitter or TikTok. All righty, Beth. I think that's it for the weekly housekeeping. Let's get into tonight's stories. Well... Like many of our stories, this one began with a newspaper article that was published on November 19, 1726, in Britain's Mists Weekly Journal. It read, quote, From Guildford comes a strange but well-attested piece of news, that a poor woman who lives at Godalming was about a month past delivered by Mr. John Howard, an eminent surgeon and man midwife, of a creature resembling a rabbit, but whose heart and lungs grew outside its belly. About 14 days since she was delivered by the same person of a perfect rabbit, and in a few days after, of four more. And on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the fourth, fifth, and sixth instant, of one in each day. In all nine They died all in bringing into the world. The woman hath made oath that two months ago, being working in a field with other women, they put up a rabbit, who, running from them, they pursued it, but to no purpose. This created in her such a longing to it, that she, being with child, was taken ill and miscarried, and from that time she hath not been able to avoid thinking of rabbits. People, after all, differ much in their opinion about this matter, some looking upon them as great curiosities, fit to be presented to the Royal Society, etc. Others are angry at the account and say that if it be a fact, a veil should be drawn over it as an imperfection in human nature. So, in case you didn't catch that because it was written in older English, a woman had given birth to nine rabbits. What the hell? (laughs) I know. Her name was Mary Denyer Toft, and by all accounts, 
It was true. Mary was born in Godalming, Surrey, about 40 miles from London, which was one of the poorest areas in the county. She got married at the age of 17 to 18-year-old Joshua Toft, who was a journeyman wool textile worker, and the couple had two children by the time Mary was 25. Every day, Mary walked two hours from her home to the hop field where she worked. <laughs> the hop field. And she gave birth to rabbits. <laughs> oh, my God. I know hop goes in beer. <laughs> Only you. I mean, it is kind of funny. I am a funny, punny bunny. One particular day in September, Mary and a fellow field worker noticed some rabbits. The law then was that pregnant women were supposed to work up until the day they gave birth. Mary had miscarried a month earlier, around four months into her pregnancy, and for whatever reason, seeing these rabbits in the field triggered something unbelievable. Mary said she and the other woman tried to catch them, but couldn't, and from that moment on, all she could think about was how badly she wanted some rabbit to eat. She stated that it was a, quote, constant and strong desire. She even dreamed about rabbits. They had bewitched her, for lack of a better word. In fact, I'm kind of shocked she wasn't accused of witchcraft, since a month later, she went into labor. At first, her neighbor Mary Gill assisted in the birth, joined soon after by her mother-in-law, Anne Toft. But soon, the local doctor was summoned. His name was John Howard, and the good doctor was shocked and amazed by the child Mary delivered, because it wasn't a child at all. According to Dr. Howard, it was, quote, three legs of a cat of a tabby color and one leg of a rabbit. The guts were as a cat's, and in them were three pieces of the backbone of an eel, end quote. Ew. Double ew. Not long after, Dr. Howard was called again because Mary was inexplicably in labor again. This time, the poor woman gave birth to nine rabbits, one right after the other. None of them survived the ordeal, but miraculously, Mary did. And over the next several months, the woman continued to look and act as though she was carrying an infant, only to give birth to a total of 17 rabbits. Dr. Howard was stumped. He collected each of Mary's rabbit offspring and pickled them in specimen jars. And he started writing letters, a lot of letters, to every single doctor he could think of, including the king's personal surgeon. In a letter he wrote to King George I's secretary, he said, quote, Sir, since I wrote to you, I have taken or delivered the poor woman of three more rabbits, all three half-grown, one of them a dun rabbit. The last leapt 23 hours in the uterus before it died. As soon as the 11th rabbit was taken away, up leapt the twelfth rabbit, which is now leaping. If you have any curious person that is pleased to come post, may see another leap in her uterus and shall take it from her if he pleases, which will be a great satisfaction to the curious. If she had been with child, she has but ten days more to go, so I do not know how many rabbits may be behind. I have brought the woman to Guildford for better convenience. I am, sir, your humble servant, John Howard. So yeah, Dr. Howard had insisted that Mary come to Guildford so he could keep watch over her in his own house. Mary, by the way, became quite the local celebrity. Yeah, I bet. King George was intrigued enough to send two men to look into it. Nathaniel St. Andre, his Swiss surgeon anatomist, and Samuel Molyneux, the Prince of Wales' secretary. In a case of the most perfect timing, when the two men arrived at Dr. Howard's house, 
Mary Toft was in the middle of giving birth. As St. Andre watched, Mary's stomach jumped and quaked as if something was fighting its way out. Initially, Mary was very calm, as if she'd done this multiple times before, which, by the way, she had. As the rabbit, the 15th one to be birthed that night, made its way through the birth canal, Mary shrieked in agony as its sharp claws tore her flesh. The birth was so horrific as the rabbit clawed its way into the world that when it finally emerged, it was not only dead, but ripped to pieces. As you can imagine, poor Mary was in horrible pain. And I'm cringing <laughs> as I tell you that part. Well, you think she would have died after that from you know, blood loss. Of all kinds of things, but yeah, blood loss for sure. St. Andre was gobsmacked by what he had just witnessed, and he insisted that Mary must come to London. In the interim, St. Andre returned to the city with several pickled rabbit specimens to show King George. He felt Mary should be studied by all the great doctors, and in order to persuade her, he offered her a royal pension. Now, remember, I had said there were two men who were sent by King George and who came to see Mary Toft that day. St. Andre was convinced, but Samuel Molyneux was not. Molyneux actually examined the rabbits closely and determined pretty quickly that at least one of them had grass and hay in its stomach. How could that have happened? Did the rabbit somehow magically ingest a meal while in utero? And Molyneux realized not all the rabbits appeared to be the same age. Some were merely in the fetus stage, while some appeared to be at least three months old. To him, they had a problem. But not to St. Andre. He was 100% convinced that Mary Toft had carried and birthed rabbits. Molyneux had no doubt that Mary had carried them inside her body, but he suspected that an actual rabbit mother had done the birthing first. Ick. <laughs> yeah. It's just a giant ick. King George decided that he really needed more experts to weigh in. So rather than bring Mary to London just yet, he sent another doctor to see her at Dr. Howard's house in Guildford. This time, it was a German surgeon named Syriacus Allers. Dr. Allers arrived with a friend of his named Mr. Brandt. Allers discovered all kinds of things. First, he found Mary's behavior quite odd. Although she didn't appear pregnant to him, she held her legs and knees together when she moved, as though she was trying to keep something from falling out. When Dr. Howard announced that the rabbits were about to be born, he wouldn't allow Allers to tend to Mary at all or assist in the births. So, although he did witness what appeared to be a real, actual birth, he couldn't get close enough for any hands-on evaluation. But after the rabbits were born, he was able to study them, and he discovered that not only did the rabbit's stomach or dung contain hay and grass, but also corn. Obviously, these things were not coming from Mary's womb. Well, I'd say, <laughs> if she's <laughs> giving birth to backbones of eels and cat parts and rabbits, why not hay and corn <laughs> and <Yeah>. grass? <laughs> Allers reported to King George on November 21st that he believed it was all a hoax and that Mary and Dr. Howard were in cahoots. But he didn't let on to Mary and Dr. Howard. He left them believing that he supported them with a pickled specimen in his possession. When he got back to London and examined the specimen, he determined that the rabbit showed signs of man-made knife cuts. 
Mary, believing that Dr. Allers was on her side, reportedly gave birth to cat's legs and a pig's bladder while she waited to be summoned to London. On November 29th, Mary arrived in London and was set up in Lacey's Bognio, a bathhouse in Leicester Fields. Could be Bagno. I don't know if they're doing an Italian thing or a Spanish thing or if I totally said it wrong, but it's a bathhouse. Dozens of doctors came to see her, including those who supported St. Andre's insistence that it was all legit, and those who were skeptical and supported Allers. But between November 30th and December 3rd, Mary became desperately ill. You would think she would. I thought you would say something. <laughs> I've got so many things running through my head right now that... I've, I've made you speechless? Yes. According to Richard Manningham, who was one of the skeptics, he couldn't figure out what exactly he was seeing. He said, quote, The motion on the right side of her belly, which they called the leaping up of the rabbit, the flushing of her face, the quickening of her pulse, and the fact that the opening to her uterus spread a little, as it would in the later stages of pregnancy, it appeared as though she was actually giving birth. But then, without warning, Mary went into convulsions for two full hours, where her fingers curled up, her eyes rolled back in her head, and her stomach rippled. She made a horrible whining noise, and she seemed to pass out. At one point, doctors couldn't detect a pulse. And then, just as suddenly, the convulsions stopped, and Mary fell asleep. When she woke up, she had no memory at all of what had happened. Soon after, a porter was caught sneaking into Mary's room, carrying a rabbit. When he was questioned, the porter would only say that it was Mary's sister-in-law who had told him to deliver the smallest rabbit he could find. Mary Toft finally confessed on December 7th, after being threatened with surgery to see what kind of, quote, strange reproductive organs she had. It seems she had manually inserted the rabbits into herself, sometimes leaving them there for weeks before performing the whole birthing performance. That's one hell of a trick. I, I gotta say, as far as hoaxes go, this is the grossest and most cringeworthy one I've ever heard of. Don't try this at home. <laughs> ever. No. <laughs> During her trial... Mary blamed her husband, her mother-in-law, and a random organ grinder's wife for making her do it. On December 9th, Mary was accused of being a notorious and vile cheat and spent four months in Bridewell Prison. And now we return to the newspapers, because although my story began with an article proclaiming the rabbit births were genuine, I'm going to end with how historical documents vilified her. And not just her, but both Dr. St. Andre and Dr. Howard. Authorities believed Dr. Howard had been a knowing and willing accomplice all along. He who was able to prove his innocence, luckily, and maintain his standing in the community. St. Andre wasn't so lucky. He lost his court position and ended up dying in a poorhouse. Daily crowds gathered in front of Bridewell Prison to gawk at Mary Toft, who was kept in a cell that was visible to the public. She was released from Bridewell on April 8, 1727, because in the end, authorities didn't know what she was really guilty of. Yeah, she duped everyone, but she never made any money from it, and she hadn't harmed anyone except herself. A little less than a year after her release, she gave birth again, but for real this time. Her daughter Elizabeth was born in February 1728. The Godalming Parish Register listed the event as her, quote, 
first child after her pretended rabbit breeding. When the Duke of Richmond spent time in his house in Guildford, he often invited Mary over as a curiosity for his various guests. She was imprisoned again in 1740 for receiving stolen goods, but was again acquitted. The parish register made note of her once again when she passed away at age 60 in 1763. The entry reads, Mary Toft, widow, the impostress, rabbit. That is indeed a bizarre story. It's bizarre. And there's so many things I don't understand. First of all, did they really think back in the early 1700s that a rabbit could impregnate a woman? I mean, do you have, do you, do you know the size the rabbit would have to be to get it on <laughs> with the woman? I don't think it was that at all. There was a term for it, which I can't, I can't think of off the top of my head. But what they believed in was like an imprinting, like an immaculate conception kind of deal. Although I don't want to offend anybody's religious beliefs by calling it that. But they basically believed back then that you could see something because, you know, women were so delicate. And right. so, you know, if you saw something that disturbed you or bothered you in a certain way, that you could become impregnated by that thing. Not right. actually doing it with the thing. Right. Yeah. I don't remember what it's called. It has a name. I don't know. It still doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, what about these poor women that are like working with cows every day? Well, they're not upset by the cows, I guess, <laughs> and don't have dreams about them. That's why it's amazing to me that she wasn't accused of witchcraft. Right. That's true. And another thing is, how the hell did she not get some kind of bacterial infection? I mean, that's a lot of crap to stick up there. It's a lot of and dead stuff with, yeah. Potential for very serious, deadly illness. And then after that, down the line, she, you know, had another child. Right. Ugh. I, that's, I, I just don't get it. It's an amazing story. I know. I mean, and it was with her husband. Who'd want to go there after <laughs> all that came out? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I bet there wasn't a lot of foreplay going on back then. Very interesting, dear. It's a moment of history that we don't want repeating itself, that's for sure. I'm surprised we haven't seen something like that yet in the, the newspapers. Well, maybe after the story. No, we're not giving people ideas like that. That's irresponsible. No, don't do it. <laughs> Plus, you can go to jail for that. <laughs> I think it's called bestiality. Animal cruelty. Oh, that's true. Hey, did you know? In 1737, Galileo's admirers moved his body from a nondescript crypt to the north side of Florence's Basilica Santa Croce, across from Michelangelo. During the move, someone decided to liberate Galileo of two of his fingers, one thumb, some vertebrae, and a tooth. Somehow, the vertebrae ended up at the University of Padua, but the rest of the missing bones stayed in one family for almost 200 years, until they disappeared in 1905. Sometime in the early 20th to 21st century, a jar filled with a mixture of bones showed up at auction. They had no idea who the bones belonged to, but one very smart person recognized what could be contained in the jar and purchased it, bringing it directly to the Museum of the History of Science in Florence, where they've been ever since. But if you want to see Galileo's middle finger, you'd have to go to Florence's Museo Galileo for that. Who'd have thunk it? So, my dear, where did your mind wander this week? Well, I'm betting you that if you were to ask anyone on the street where to spot Bigfoot, without hesitating, almost everyone would say Washington State. The Pacific Northwest, including Northern California, has been the place to look for decades. 
But other known hot spots include Ohio, Texas, Florida, and New York. Yes, believe it or not, New York is on the list. And the beautiful historic town of Whitehall has been the center of it all for decades, especially during the 70s. But in case you're thinking, yeah, but that was back in the 1970s, and that was quite a long time ago. Well, perhaps so. But then there's this. On August 7th, 2018, a motorist was on Route 4 in Whitehall at 10.10 p.m., heading towards the Vermont border, when he had a sighting. According to the report, the man thought there was a large stump by the side of the road. But then, the stump moved and stood up on two feet until it appeared to be about six feet tall. It was covered in hair, and the motorist watched as it stepped over the guardrail and disappeared. The man, who chose to remain anonymous, reported his sighting to Whitehall resident and Bigfoot expert and author Paul Bartholomew. Bartholomew stated on his Facebook page, the light of his vehicle passed between the creature's legs, showing a big outline of two legs, a body, wide shoulders, and a head. It was black. The witness said, I couldn't believe it. My mouth just dropped open. The next day, Bartholomew and the witness drove out to the spot and were able to make a cast of a shallow footprint that was about 12 inches long and 5 inches wide. The original encounters with Bigfoot in Whitehall gained public attention in 1975. The first documented case happened on the golf course of the Skeen Valley Country Club. The owner of the club, Cliff Sparks, claimed he saw a bipedal hairy creature with red eyes right on the edge of the green next to the first hole before it went crashing off into the woods. On August 24, 1976, three teenage boys, Paul Goslin, Martin Paddock, and Bart Kinney, were driving in a truck down Abar Road when they passed a field. Suddenly, they all saw a massive creature covered in fur standing at the side of the road. They drove past it and turned around to see it again. As they made their second pass, they heard terrible screaming like a woman was being attacked. And then the creature charged their truck. In their haste to get away, they burned a 57-foot tire mark onto the road. The boys went directly to the police station to file a report of what they had just seen. They described it as a 7 to 8 foot tall, bipedal creature covered in short, thick brown hair. The hair on its head was longer. They estimated it weighed between 300 to 400 pounds, and its eyes glowed red. Kinney insisted it was not a bear. The police were skeptical, but Paul Goslin's father was not. He had heard what he had thought to have been the same eerie screaming on a bear road a year before. And Paul's brother Brian Goslin, who just happened to be on the Whitehall Police Force, had his own encounter on a bear road the very next night on August 25th. Goslin stopped his patrol car and got out, and was instantly aware that everything was way too quiet. There were no crickets whatsoever. Then, in the strange silence, it sounded like something very large was crashing through the thick foliage, heading right towards him. He spun towards the sound, and illuminated in the beam of his flashlight stood the eight-foot-tall Bigfoot. He described it as having long hairy limbs like an orangutan, black lips, and those glowing red eyes. It was standing barely 30 feet away from him. As soon as the flashlight beam hit the creature's face, it let out a 20-second-long gorilla-like roar, so loud that it reverberated in Goslin's chest. The man swore he even felt heat brush his face from the creature's lungs, like, quote, someone blowing a tuba in your face. Then the creature took off across the field with giant seven-foot strides, bellowing three more times as it went. Other police officers discovered 19-inch-long tracks near the Pulteney River Bridge, about eight miles away from Abel Road. They made plaster casts of the footprints, which were detailed enough to show dermal ridges. The sightings made the local paper the Post Star, with headlines like, Officers Track Creatures. Upward of ten witnesses came forward to say that they had seen Bigfoot, including deputy sheriffs and state troopers. 
Paul Bartholomew, the Bigfoot expert that I had mentioned at the top of my story, was just 12 years old and living in Whitehall when he read the newspaper articles. He was already infatuated with Bigfoot, but from there, he became a lifelong believer and researcher. Six years later in 1982, two police officers were on patrol right before dawn at the base of Lake Champlain when they watched a Bigfoot bound up a steep embankment in just mere seconds. One of the police officers, named Danny Gordon, even completed a lie detector test about his sighting, and he passed. Warren Cook, an anthropologist at Castleton College, was so intrigued by the Whitehall sightings that he logged and cataloged as many as he could. If that were it, the handful of sightings three or four decades ago, you might wonder why all the hoopla hasn't died down. You might wonder how the annual Whitehall Sasquatch Festival, which has been happening for a decade now, still manages to draw in thousands of visitors in a single afternoon. Yes, Paul Bartholomew and Brian Goslin have been presenters in the past, but why is it still going? Well, because the sightings didn't end in 1982. If you visit the BFRO website, which we've mentioned before, it's a constantly updated database of Bigfoot sightings all over the country, meticulously cataloged by state and individual counties. You can find eight verified sightings in Whitehall since 1989. By verified, I mean that dedicated researchers, many of them with military or police force or survivalist backgrounds, interview each person who submits a report. There are three from Whitehall that I want to share. In January of 1989, a witness was staying at a friend's house in Whitehall. Around 3.30 p.m. as they were walking in the woods, they had the sudden feeling that they were being watched. They noticed that there were strange tracks on the ground, about 20 inches long and several branches about 15 feet up had been broken off the trees. Feeling unnerved, they returned to the house. The following morning, around 6.30 a.m., the witness woke up to the sight of a massive creature standing about 20 feet away from the front of the house. It walked on two feet and appeared human, except it was covered in dark hair. After watching it for five minutes, the creature walked towards the house, and as it passed by, it slammed its body into the side of the house, waking up the witness's friend. Then it disappeared into the woods beside the house. That's not a very pleasant way to be woken up, I would assume. Not at all. <laughs> On November 7th and 8th of 2004, a witness paid a visit to their family property on a mountain near the town of Whitehall. The witness had remembered hearing wood knocks when he was growing up and was curious to return to their family farm that they ran on the property. When they were a kid, their parents always explained it as trespassers chopping down a tree with an axe, but it always happened every single time that they were in the woods. This time, the witness said that they were barely a quarter of a mile into the woods heading uphill when they began hearing tree knocks off to their west. As they continued onward, the knocks seemed to encircle them, coming from all directions. As they crested the ridge and approached a road, the knocking tapered off. The following day, they decided to head out to an abandoned site that their family used during the tree farm days. Again, the woods filled with knocking, always coming from the direction the witness was headed in. When they reached the site, which was in a small clearing, they had some lunch and collected some vegetation. The witness just happened to be an ecologist. They jumped when they thought they heard what must be a deer making a buck snort noise, but it didn't sound natural, almost if it was a simulated version. Feeling uneasy, they grabbed the rifle. As soon as they did, several small rocks came out of nowhere, sailing over their head. Spook, the witness, left the area, rifle at the ready. And finally, in June of 2019, a man was walking his dog at the northern end of Whitehall, around 4 or 5 p.m. A tractor trailer rounded a corner, and as soon as it did, the man could see a six-foot-tall, bipedal creature with a conical-shaped head 
and it was covered in dark brown hair. Its arms were long like an ape's. The man turned around immediately and walked away from the creature, continuously glancing over his shoulder at it. He estimated that it weighed 200 pounds and said that it was slender and had no discernible gender. It headed off in the opposite direction of the man. His dog, which was a beagle, did not notice the creature. The man, who is a hunter, said it was absolutely not a bear. Paul Bartholomew was able to get a cast of 12-inch tracks and reported finding what could have been a nest or bedding in a nearby area. So yes, Whitehall, New York may rightfully be the Bigfoot capital of New York. And the Whitehall Sasquatch Festival, as we've mentioned numerous times over the last several episodes, is happening on September 30th this year, from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. If you're interested in hearing presentations, Paul Bartholomew was there last year, and I'm pretty sure Brian Gosling was too. And if you're like us and love being out in the fresh air of the Adirondacks, there are tables of footcast and photographs to look at and purchase. So if you're interested in Bigfoot merchandise, as well as other crafts, or even meeting us, stop on by. And by the way, you should definitely stay for the Bigfoot calling contest at 5 p.m. It's a real treat. It certainly is. And we had the best time last year when we went. That we did. We just had so much fun walking around and looking at all the photographs and the foot casts. And at one point, we happened to be by the water and we looked up and there was this unbelievably gothic mansion up on the hill. It was gorgeous. And being who we are, we found a police officer and asked him what it was. And he said it was the Skeen Manor House because yes. Whitehall used to be called Skeensboro before it was Whitehall. So we gave ourselves a little history lesson as we were walking around. But I have to say the most exciting part for me was that one of the vendors had a cast of the Honey Island Swamp Monsters. That he did, and we tried Boy. to buy it, but he wouldn't sell it to us. Well, for good reason. It was autographed. That it was, yes. By the daughter of the man that exactly. discovered the Honey Island Swamp Monster. Yeah. But it was neat because we had just done an episode about it, and to see it in real life was just really cool. Yeah, and Whitehall is just a quaint little town that's nestled in the Adirondacks, and I'm telling you, you cannot beat the views. You should really go if you can. And we'd love to see you there. That we would. All right. Well, as always, if you'd like to know more about the topics that we covered, you can always go to our show notes to find our sources. That you can. And if you enjoyed our episode or any of our episodes, don't forget to leave us a five-star review and a comment on Spotify or Apple or any of your favorite listening platforms. Those reviews really mean a lot to us. They do, and we appreciate them. We'll see you all next week for an all-new episode of Where Minds Wander. See you soon. <laughs>